this first our top story cameroon is commemorating the 15th anniversary of nigeria's peaceful handover of the oil rich bakasi peninsula moki edwin kinzeka reports from yaounde cameroon officials in cameroon say a series of activities to commemorate the anniversary of the handover of the Bakasi Peninsula to Cameroon have taken place in several towns and villages in the region. Nigeria ceded the oil-rich peninsula to Cameroon on August 14, 2008, six years after the International Court of Justice ruled the long-disputed area belonged to Cameroon. Aboko Patrick is the mayor of Kombo Abedimo in Bakasi, He says they have organized activities to celebrate 15 years of peace with Nigerians in the four districts that make up Bakasi. Bakasi conflict is still fresh in our mind, and we do not want a replay of the Bakasi crisis in this peninsula, specifically at Akwa, where the handing over of the Bakasi peninsula took place, where the Nigerian flag was lowered to hand over Bakasi to Cameroon. The dispute over the region dates back decades and often erupted into violence. Aboko says since the Nigerian military and administration left Bakasi in 2008, Cameroon's government has built hundreds of public facilities, schools, government offices, markets, hospitals and roads. But Bakasi residents say Cameroon still needs to do much more to make the estimated 300,000 people of the peninsula feel they are now Cameroonians. Some complain the Cameroon government troops routinely harass people who do not have Cameroon national identity cards and threaten to send civilians who do not pay a bribe to Nigeria. Cameroon troops say they are in the area which is in the Gulf of Guinea to protect civilians from harassment by armed gangs. Edonde Cornelius is the mayor of Combo Etindi in Bakasi. He says despite the military presence, there still are frequent attacks, forcing some residents to flee one village. A few days ago, I'm robbers visited some fishing settlements and we informed security to keep a watchful eye both day and night. Why we've abandoned Ngoso is because we don't have security. In Cameroon's capital, Yaoundé, there was a ceremony to present awards to Cameroon President Paul Bia and former Nigerian President Olusegun Obasanjo. Joseph Vincent Tuda Ebode is a conflict resolution specialist at the University of Yaoundé. He says the awards recognize Bia and Obasanjo for avoiding war and negotiating an end to the Bakasi dispute. President Biya has his prize because he chose the peaceful resolution of that conflict and President Obasanjo to the same road. And if you have peace today, it is the commitment of the two people. Biya and Obasanjo signed what's known as the Green Tree Agreement on June 12, 2006, and Nigerian troops withdrew from Bakasi on August 14, 2008. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé, Cameroon. In a rare televised speech Monday, General Abdel Fattah Brohan, the head of Sudan's military, accused the rival Rapid Support Forces, commanded by Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, of committing war crimes, despite promising to restore democracy. Amnesty International has accused both warring parties of committing extensive war crimes. Joseph Siegel, Director of Research at Africa Center for Strategic Studies, discussed these developments with VOA Senior Analyst Mohamed al Shanawi. General Brahan's claims are consistent with reports we've been hearing since the conflict erupted and, in fact, which seem to have escalated in the the past months. The uh, Rapid Support Forces, the RSF, is consistently alleged to have targeted civilians. They're using civilians as a shield, which is a potential war crime. They have uh, ethnically targeted communities in the western part of the country in Darfur. 
and General Delgado Hemeti, uh, his claims that uh, he is working to restore democracy have absolutely no credibility. In fact, he had very limited trust on the part of the general population prior to this conflict. And now with the systematic attacks on civilians, he has even less support than before. So there's you know, just no way that he can be seen as somehow as a champion for democracy in Sudan. Amnesty International has accused both warring parties of committing extensive war crimes, including deliberate killings of civilians and mass sexual assault. In its 56-page report, the group said almost all rape cases were blamed on the RSF and its allied Arab militias. Would that report support Al-Burhan's position? Obviously, Burhan is not the best spokesperson, as he himself has repeatedly undercut the democratic transition in Sudan, and his intransigence is you know, partly to blame for the descent into this lawlessness and conflict that we're seeing in Sudan. Moreover, Sudan armed forces, which General Burhan commands, have bombed the civilian areas. But the sense is that that has been primarily aimed at trying to root out the RSF. It hasn't been a wanton targeting of civilians. Therefore, I think it is fair to say that uh, you know most of these atrocities are being pinned on the RSF, and we shouldn't draw a false equivalence between the two sides, despite the fact that Sudan armed forces also have a much to account for. Is there a practical mechanism for accountability for these crimes? Well, this is the problem of facing a collapsed state where there is lawlessness. And so I think the first and most important thing that can be done is to continue to signal to both sides that they will not be recognized, even if one side were to prevail, international community, the regional actors need to convey they are not going to be recognized as the sovereign head of state. And therefore, there's not a political end game for this where they come out on top. I think that's really important because in reports suggest, especially among Hemeti, that he thinks that he can sustain you know, this conflict and eventually, uh, if he's able to prevail over the Sudan armed forces, that the international community will come around and recognize him. So I think he needs to be disabused of that impression and that calculation. I think that can be reinforced with sanctioning individuals and institutions involved in financing this conflict and in getting arms into the conflict. So that's both in Sudan and those who are enabling that from outside. I think it is going to require more engagement on the part of the United Nations would be critical to enhancing accountability. And I think we need to turn to the ICC. This is exactly what the ICC was created for when prosecutions couldn't take place at the national level. And we should recall that International Criminal Court was active in Sudan during the genocide in Darfur, you know, 20 years ago. And that put an enormous amount of political pressure on the then leader, uh, Omar al-Bashir, and it limited his travel, it, it limited his credibility, and really painted him into a corner. And I think if that, you know, if Hemeti and members of the RSF, and potentially members of the Sudan Armed Forces, are alleged, or if there's a arrest warrant put out for them on war crimes, I think it would further isolate them politically and force them to consider other exit strategies. 